I'm going to kind of explain a few things. Let's see. Uh, my name is Mikaela Rubalcaba, and I'm a professor of education in, here at TMCC. I've been here for a long time, 15 years, and we've been doing free, which is faculty for radical education and enlightenment for the last uh, 13, 14 years. And what this does is it takes existing classes already, you already have to meet for psychology or poli-sci or English or whatever you have to meet for, and it brings you together in an interdisciplinary way to explore difficult, controversial topics. So today we thought we'd pick a really difficult one, race. Woo, that's a hard one. Okay, very challenging. And we're exploring it through the idea of the colorblind ideal. So we'd all love, of course, to have sort of a colorblind society where we're just all the same, we're all red on the inside, but we're all friends and the same one whole one world on the outside, right? That colorblind ideal, that's what I teach in, in part in some of my education classes, teach the kids to love each other and we're all one. And that's a great ideal, but as we know, in our society, racial stratification exists, and there's a black intellectual, Cornell West, who was writing about this years ago in a book that he wrote called Race Matters, and now we have this Black Lives Matter movement, and it's the whole concept that we really can't get away from the fact that we have racial, racial stratification in our institutions, in our prison system, and in our educational system, yet the dichotomy and the paradox of the fact that we love to have a colorblind society and all be one, all one people, like Martin Luther King uh, Jr. was talking about in I Have a Dream. So we're going to explore the underpinnings of this issue, and in my class, children's literature, we read a book called The Seven Blind Mice, for, uh, and it was for um, kindergartners. And it was talking about this story of these seven blind mice that were trying to figure out what this object was you know, out, out, out of their campground. And so each blind mice one day went to and touched this object, this big object that they saw, and the first one went and they were feeling along this object and he came running back and he said, oh my gosh, it's a snake. And really what he had felt was the trunk of an elephant. And in the end of the story, when the seven blind mice came back after a week, they figured out as a whole, blind as they were, that what we, they were dealing with was an actual big elephant. So the concept there, from that, from that I had my students write some haiku, some of the haiku are up up there on the, on the uh, screens there, and they came up with some haiku uh, uh, poetry about uh, what colorblind and blindness may mean. And from that concept, I was able to come up with this idea of the elephant in the room, how race is the elephant in the room, the big white privilege is the elephant in the room, and how we need to explore that. So I came up with the art journaling, where's my disc? It's somewhere. The elephant, can you hold it up? Hold that up, thank you, there it is over there. And the idea there is I do art journaling and we're using in this forum art as a method to explore knowledge and to advance knowledge, just like writing and reading on the linguistic side of the brain is a way to advance knowledge. We're gonna use some art to advance knowledge. So. I did some embedded journaling and came up with this elephant in the room type of concept. And so on your tables, you have a disc, a similar disc. Could you hold up this disc? A similar disc. And you're going to be hearing some lectures. You're going to be seeing statistics. You're going to hear present student presentations about their beautiful artwork that they did for Candace's class exploring this topic. You're going to hear some anthropologists talk about race and culture and white privilege and various concepts there. And as you're hearing these, you are going to pass around the disc and write notes. But just like you would in a regular class, you kind of write notes, you know. This is writing notes in a collaborative way. Everyone at all times, there should be at least one person writing on that disc. So we want you real busy. And in the end, you'll have these embedded notes, kind of hidden notes, that Candace is going to do one last piece of the art project at the very end with some white pens to kind of work with that a bit. 
Okay? So without much further ado, we're into anthropology with Julia Hammett. So start taking notes, okay? Now's your time. Pick up the pen and start rotating that disc around. Hi there. My name's Julia Hammett. I'm an anthropologist. I've been teaching here around 20 years. And a lot of the courses I teach are actually courses about diversity. And um, there are many concepts that I could introduce today, but I don't want to overwhelm you with concepts. So I'm, I want to introduce you to three concepts that you can see on the screen there. And, I, and I'm going to uh, transition quickly to some students who want to talk about their work. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, the first one is institutional racism. A system of public policies, institutional practices, and popular culture norms that reinforce, f reinforcing and perpetuate racial and group inequity. Now, um, we're in an institution, TMCC, and there are a whole lot of ways that are very subtle that we don't necessarily give everyone the same equal opportunity. We try, but sometimes things are in embedded in our, in our false assumptions about people just when we look at them. And so this is one of the things we want to keep in mind today. The second one is white privilege. White people benefiting from social, political, or economic, uh, economic circumstances. These include freedom to move, buy, work, play, and speak freely in professional education and personal context. The concept of white privilege implies the right to assume uh, one's own experiences are the norms, and it discounts or dismisses other viewpoints. And I'll give you a real blatant example that you guys probably know about that's been in the media for the last six months a lot. If somebody says, black lives matter, right? I'm wearing a band here, black lives matter. And then some, and some people will say, yeah, all lives matter. Well, yeah, of course all lives matter. Nobody's saying all lives don't matter. But they're saying we have an issue in this country. We have a real issue in this country where if you're born in this country as a black person, especially a black male, you have a significantly higher chance of ending up in prison before you're 21. If you are, you have a higher, a significantly higher chance of being stopped by the police than a white person. A white person doesn't even walk in the, with the same assumptions because white people are privileged. We don't even think about our privileges. We take them for granted. We don't have to think about our privileges. We can take them for granted. But trust me, when a police, when, when a police car stops you, a whole different thing goes in your head in your, if you're a white person or if you're not a white person. And that's part of white privilege. And it, it, it permeates society. It really does. And that's one of the things I just want you to think about is how much that permeates our society. And then the third one is, is white fragility. When encountering the concept of white privilege, and, and some people in this room are going through this right now, white people tend to withdraw, defend, recoil, cry, argue, deny, minimize, ignore, or in other ways, push back to regain position and their comfort zone. So did that mean just talking about white privilege make some people feel a little uncomfortable? It should have. It, it's, it's intended to. Because we have to get a little, a little nervous, a little anxious, and be able to really engage these issues. There's discomfort that needs to happen in learning. So here I am. I've been teaching here for 20 years as an anthropologist. And it wasn't until I read this book last year, The New Jim Crow, that I went, oh my god, I'm racist. I'm racist. Now, I'm not overt, prejudicial racist, but I had to come to terms with the realization that everyone in America is racist. We all are because we're programmed to be. We are fed stereotypes our whole life. We're, we're fed stereotypes from our neighbors, in some cases our family, but certainly media. You just saw the thing on the, on the Academy Awards about it, about it, right? We're programmed about what norms are and, and what's not normal in our society. And it's really, really hard to escape. It's a lockbox. The only way we can escape it is consciously 
trying to escape it. We have to be vigilant about it our whole lives. We, we, can't, we have false assumptions and stereotypes that just sort of sneak in when we least expect it. So how do we, how do we get out of that lockbox? It's a lifelong journey. It really is. But one of the big important things we have to do is listen. We have to listen to other Americans' voices. We have to hear other people's truths. And that's how we sort of really understand what the American experience truly is. Because every single person in this room is American. And our collective stories are the American story, right? There's not one story that's more important than any other. Right? So now I'm going to turn this over. We're going to start hearing some of those voices. Where's Amy? I've lost Amy. Oh, there you are. I'm going to turn this over to Amy that's going to tell you a little bit about her art. She's Mine's on my shirt. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy. I'm one of the artists that participated in this event tell you a little bit about my design. It's a very personal story. I grew up in an upper middle class, mostly white neighborhood. My mom didn't like the school that we were going to be sent to, so she sent us across town and I attended school in the barrio in Tucson. I was one of three white people. So I had a foot in both worlds where I was privileged and where I was the minority. I have experienced racism firsthand because I am white, because I'm Italian, and because I'm, and sexism because I'm a woman. Um, interestingly enough, the majority of the racism and sexism that I experienced was directed at me by my father and my ex-husband, one of the reasons he is an ex. My mother, on the other hand, was very accepting of all people, and she had friends of every race. So even though the topic of racism was never discussed openly in my household, I learned from my mother's example. When I divorced my ex-husband, California gave custody of my two children to my ex-husband. Recently, my daughter, who's now 15, came to me and said, Mom, I want to come live with you. I have dreamt of my children being under my roof for every night that they've been gone. I asked her why. And she told me that Dad is a sexist, racist, homophobic asshole. With that statement... I realized that no matter how I chose to live my life, I would always be bound to the discriminatory demon that exists within our society. The female silhouette in the piece is created from a photograph of myself. I am chained to the demon, and I'm fighting against the words that once came from my ex-husband's mouth. The words in red are angry. However, the color also represents the pain I felt upon hearing them. The black words underneath the red create layers, which symbolize the multiple... Sorry. <laughs> the multiple times that I heard these things and was hurt by them. The words in the lower half of the image are carved in stone. And this depicts how hard it is to change people's minds once they are set. This project made me think about race, made me think about discrimination, and it also made me realize that I was living in a slightly colorblind world. It didn't seem to matter to me. I have friends of every ethnicity. But the problem is still out there. The problem of racism, sexism, homophobia, whatever discriminatory action it is, those problems exist within our society. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being so courageous. All right, and our next speaker, 
is Candace. No. no. Oh, there we go. This is my Hello, everyone. My name is Brandy Shaw, and I'm a fine arts major here at TMCC. And I'm also of Native American ethnicity. Okay. And the reason why I say I'm Native American is because there's, you don't see a lot of us in society, especially cities. But my piece came from personal colorblindness as a Native American woman and as a student. <clears throat> I was, ever since I grew up on the reservation, I was in the classroom and I would, you know, be taught a lesson like, oh, this happened in history and this happened in history. But me coming from a Native American household, I would raise my hand and I'd say, well, this didn't happen. Like, what about this? What about this time in history? You know, that was based off Native American history. And so um, I created this piece to not only inform people of what you're being taught in, like, in society, also as digi um, the education system, is that we're not being told the complete truth about what actually happened, what ground you're stepping on today. And I listed some events on the desk. It's supposed to be a desk with a history book that says History Lies. And on there, there's some events in time that say, um, well, I believe are very important, like the relocate, accumulate, terminate of Native Americans. Also, Wounded Knee, the Dakota 38 plus two, who were, it was the biggest mass execution in US history held by Abraham Lincoln. But I wanted to educate others and also the Native youth that, <clears throat> that the truth is out there. And sometimes what you're being told in school isn't completely the truth. But that's my, that's my piece right here. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's continue to take notes, active note taking on our disc. I see some tables are doing really well with that. There are some Sharpies now out at some tables. Use those too. Let's just keep taking lots of notes because every single person that speaks is giving us new information to explore this difficult topic. Okay, the next one. This is perfect. Here's our last student for, for right now. Okay. Hi, my name is David. Um, my piece is essentially both racism, like sexism, you know, separation, political. Okay, they want me to move. Um, okay. Uh, the title of the piece is Bring Out the Gunman. And at the top it says, so many idiots, so few bullets. And around it, it's kind of an oxymoron because it's just covered in just little outlines of bullets and stuff like that. Um, for the racism is, you know, you have like the black community and the hip hop and stuff like that. They're always using the derogatory terms towards themselves. And if any other race or culture says the same word, they get super offended by it. And for me, that's why I said it's so many idiots, is because the only way racism is going to stop is if they do it. And it's just like with any other, any other race. So it's like, I've been called a cracker and everything else like that. And it's like, I'm like, I don't care. You know, um, the sexism part is essentially, you know, based on I lost my train of thought on that one. Yeah. Yeah, for the sexism part, you know, it's, it kind of goes along, like, I'm the minority in my class. I'm the only male in the printmaking class. So, you know, when it comes down, comes down to um, being sexism, it's like, I don't care. It's like, we're all in there together. You know, I participate, and that's what it is. Um, for the political reasons, as you know, there's like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders and stuff like that. It's, they're all idiots. That's how I view politics. 
Um, but yeah, it's to me the only reason why I chose Boba Fett is in their first original movies when Star Wars came out is you don't know what color he is. It's only in when they made episode one and two and three is when you actually find out that he's like Tongan or a dark skin color. And so the reason why I went with this is because of the first original three, I use movies, comics, and video games for my artwork and brings up the nostalgia factor for me. But he has that no fucks given attitude. It's just, you mess with me, it's over. So that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all three of you for helping us to understand some of these amazing pieces of art we see on the desk and what they mean to you personally. This is, this is their truth. This is their story about what they have instilled in their own art. But that's not enough. Every single person in this room has their own truth, their own life experience, how they view the world. And even that is not enough voices. We need to understand every single human being has their own sense of who they are and it's, it's their life experiences and it's also the programming we get. And we need to tease it apart so that we can all live together and respect each other. So sometimes we just need to stop and think. Now I'm gonna turn the mic over to Karina who's gonna talk about the film you're about to see. Hello everyone, my name is Karina Weidinger and I teach art history classes here. And what I wanna show you next is a short video called Stop. And you have the image on the screen. It's made by an artist called Dred Scott. And that's actually not his name, it's a pseudonym. It's actually the name of a former slave who sued the United States for his freedom he actually lost. Uh, and so this artist took over that name and most of his artwork deals with institutionalized racism. So Julia actually mentioned before this uh, example of stopping. So stop and frisk is a major theme. And I want to show you this video. It's about three minutes long. I don't want to say anything more right now. After you watch it, I will tell you a little bit more about the project. been stopped 60 or more times. I've been stopped by the cops 150 times, probably a little bit more. I've been stopped in search more than 100 times. I've been stopped. 60 or more times. I've been stopped by the police 30 times or more. I've been stopped about 20 times. I get stopped by the cops every day, but 150s, that about sums it up. I've been stopped about 60 times or more. I've been stopped 70 times. I've been stopped and searched more than a hundred times. I've been stopped a lot of times. I've been stopped about 50 times. 60 times or more. I've been stopped about 20 times. 60 times or more. I've been stopped about 30 times or more. I've been stopped somewhere in the hundreds, close to. I've been stopped by the police 30 times or more. I've been stopped by the police 30 times or more. I've been stopped 
70 times. I've been stopped 150 times. I've been stopped and searched more than 100 times. I've been stopped about 20 times. So you've seen the video now. I want to tell you a little bit about how the artist chose these young men. So when you're looking at the screen, this is actually how this would be seen in a museum or a gallery. So what you saw was a part of it. This is actually seven minutes long, so it's longer than the three minutes that you've seen. And also it's displayed in a gallery like this. So you actually have two projections. One of them is on the left, the left wall. And those are three young men from Brooklyn, New York. And then on the right are three more young men, and they are from Liverpool, UK. And the reason the artist chose young men from these two places is because in 1996, the chiefs of police in both these cities have met and agreed on a zero tolerance policing strategy. And as a result of that, until 2013, about five million people have been stopped and frisked. And as you can see in this video, most of them are African Americans, and also Latinos are stopped, mostly. And this happens despite the fact that the police has kept numbers on these stops, and they've realized that in nine times out of 10, these men are not doing anything wrong, anything illegal at all. They're just walking down the street. So what they do is they racially profile them, they stop them, and they frisk them. So they look to see if they have guns or drugs on them, and if they do, then they get arrested. All right, so nine times out of 10, they're not doing anything at all other than just walking down the street. Uh, and here's where this idea of institutional racism comes in. It's a great example of that because that's what's actually happening. It's a level of the police departments and also white privilege. So, um, you know, I've never been stopped when I was walking down the street. Uh, but if you look at some of the men in the video, you get to this number of 150 times, even 20 times, which is the lowest number on the screen. It's just a ridiculous amount of times to be stopped, right? Not be charged with anything. Just stop because you happen to walk on the streets in these neighborhoods while you're black or Latino. Uh, and so, if you were to be in an art gallery, you would actually be standing in the middle of these screens, right? So you have three men on one side, three men on the other side. And you've seen there was this moment of silence in the video. That's basically because they're standing facing each other, and you're standing in the middle, right? So you're in the middle of everything. And they're not all talking at the same time. So that's if they're having a conversation with each other across the room and across the ocean. And they're telling each other how many times they have actually been stopped. And if you're a visitor and you're standing there in the middle, you're kind of in the midst of it all. Right? You can't turn around and ignore this problem. You have to face the fact that it's happening. All right, now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Christine. OK, yeah, but let me just say first, I'm seeing the note take on the note master here, note taker master. Uh, let's see those notes actively being taken, uh, the word stop and the, some of the numbers. Let's write some of this stuff down. Let's keep it rotating. These notes should be always in motion. There should be a pen busy at all times at every table because there's 10 of you, so you don't have any excuses just to kick back. Everyone should be participating. So let's keep the notes rotating around. There's a lot of information in that. Okay, so let's keep it going, all right? This table's doing great, and I'm seeing other tables really doing it, so let's keep that note-taking active. It's part of the embedded journaling. And you're gonna be taking these notes, and then we're gonna be, Candace will be working with you to finalize it into kind of a more artistic piece, and it will be displayed. So that's why we're really kind of doing this in a special way and it was it's made with recycled materials and, and uh, actually you know I did it myself it took a lot of time so I really want you guys to get into these notes all right that's why <laughs> all right here we go next on to anthropology Christine good morning everybody <laughs> So this part of the presentation is an interactive part of the presentation. So I need your participation. Um, I will be asking for individual volunteers, so don't be afraid. And what we're gonna be doing in this part is I'm gonna be showing you a pair of pictures and asking you a question. And you have to figure out 
the best answer based on those pictures. So don't be afraid. Ultimately, this is to make us confront our own individual prejudices, racisms, etc. And don't be afraid because all of this typically is culturally and socially bound. And you may not recognize that until you actually do this. And um, if it makes you feel any better, I did this with a group of friends, and uh, if nobody participates, I have their permission <laughs> to um, talk about what they said. So is everybody ready? Really? Is everybody ready? Thank you. So let's go. So which one of these individuals, the man on the left or the man on the right, is a hip-hop dancer? Oh. Right? Anyone want to volunteer and say your own opinion? You can't really tell what someone does or what kind of occupation or where they come from or, or what kind of lifestyle they have just by um, their appearance. And usually first appearances are, are, are usually wrong. Most people, when they see someone and kind of make an evaluation, they find out later that their opinion is totally wrong, like, oh, you know, that person, I can get along. And then all of a sudden, they're the best friend, you know? So, yeah, I, I just, that's my, that's my comment. Thank you. And that's actually very true. How many of us have been guilty of misjudging somebody? Okay, so I said the one on the right, but I would say the one on the right because he's in more relaxed clothes. He's obviously standing in front of a whiteboard, kind of like uh, the Academy stars would stand in front of, which could signify that he's a dancer. And the other guy's in a suit, which I would imagine that he would be a uh, businessman, but if he did hip-hop dance, it might be on the side, and that's how I came up with my conclusion. Okay. Fair enough. So the guy on the left is actually our hip-hop dancer. His name is Dave Car Dan Carity. He's a hip-hop dancer, an actor, and singer. And the guy on the right is Jace Hall, a video game designer. And he's actually, you weren't too far off, he's actually at a video game awards show. So already starting to see about how our cultural ideas are factoring into our decisions. So you guys ready for the next one? You guys ready for the next one? Thank you. So which one of these individuals is an immigrant? Don't be shy. Anyone want to volunteer? Thank you. Uh, from my first assumption, you'd think the left, but I'm thinking the right because she looks like a model, and most models usually, you know, come in from different countries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pardon it? Can you repeat that? Isn't the one on the left a Supreme Court judge? Yes, it is. It's Sonia Sotomayor, who was born in the Bronx, is an American citizen. The other young lady, how many people are Vampire Diary fans? Yeah, it's Nina Dobrev from that show. She was born in Bulgaria, and she's actually a Canadian citizen, and she's here in the United States filming for The Vampire Diaries and other films that she's been in. So which one of these individuals attended Harvard Law School? The guy on the left or the guy on the right? Anyone want to volunteer their opinion? Sorry. Who? Oh, thank you. By the way, the reason I ask you to speak loudly is because I'm going deaf. Seriously, so. Sorry. Oh, oh should I use sign language? Yeah, anyways. <laughs> um, I feel like this is kind of a bad, uh, bad example because both of these men look like they're in almost like a talk show situation. So overall, both are well-dressed, and it's not really... I don't really know how you determine which one's a lawyer. They both look like they could be. Okay. What was your gut reaction when you first saw the image? Honestly, the one on the right. On the right? Okay. So let's see. It is the guy on the right. And the guy on the left is Rick Welts. He's the president of the Golden State Warriors, and he does not have a law degree. Whereas David Otunga, how many wrestling fans in the room? Yep. He is a WWE wrestler, and yes, he does hold a Harvard Law degree. He does practice on the side. Yes, quite the overachiever. 
Who here is the CEO? The woman on the left or the woman on the right? Anyone want to give their opinion? Thank you. I'm going to go with the woman on the left because she looks significantly happier. And I would imagine that a CEO generates a pretty handsome figure. I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Interesting answer. I've not heard that one, so thank you. So let's see which it is. It is the woman on the left. Her name is Jan Janice Bryant Howroyd. She is the CEO of Act One Group. It is an employment agency that she actually started with $1,500 and has now grown the company to a multi million dollar company. Whereas Jenna Lyons is the correct creative director of J. Crew, also considered one of the top 10 most influential women in fashion. So, two very powerful women, but the woman on the left is our CEO. Now, who here is the mathematician? Anyone want to volunteer their opinion on an answer? Anybody? Thank you. Hi. Hi. I, I think the stereotype would be the gentleman on the left but I think it's going to be the girl on the right, because girls love math. Yay, math. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. It is the woman on the right. The uh, gentleman on the left is Yo-Yo Ma. He is a cellist, very famous cellist, whereas Danica McKellar is a mathematician. She is one of the co-authors of a new uh, mathematical theorem that is widely used in physics, the chase mckellar win theorem. So ultimately, this is meant to bring to light our own personal viewpoints and cultural stereotypes that we may or may not be aware of. And I hope that you've actually learned something and start questioning some of the things you think that are very much culturally based. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Christine. All right, next we have a dual situation happening. I love this when this happens. Uh, there's going to be math statistics. Okay, that's one part of the brain. And then there's going to be a poetry reading at the same time, and the statistics were generated from Blisson back there in her math class capacity to um, amplify some of the concepts that are in this poem called Colorblind Contradictions that Molly, who's in English, found. So this is that energy of the interdisciplinary coming together. So your notes are going to have to be very crazily taken during this because it's just going to be so much information. So keep going with the notes on this and see how math and poetry comes together. So here we go. Thank you, Michaela. Um, and so I'll just open up by asking, what is poetry? What's poetry? You've all heard poems before. What is poetry? Oh, impression of the mind. What else? What else do you think of when you think of poetry? Yeah, coming from the heart. What else? Emotion. Sometimes we think of rhyme. Um, poetry has been defined as sometimes sound and sense, this combination of um, just the power of language itself, the sound, the rhythm, the patterns and meter that we have in poetry along with the meaning. Um, Cody Young, whose poem I'm going to read in a minute, um, is a poet who is a 2014-2015 Watson Fellow. He's a philosophy and sociology major. Um, he had a hard childhood. Um, he had a childhood in which his brother was incarcerated. Um, he felt distance from his new step family. Um, he grew up feeling like he was an outsider at his school. And Cody has defined poetry this way. He said, with poetry, I have the language to articulate my experience in a way that I was silent before. Um, he also said of poetry that poetry allowed him to express these deeper feelings that went down to the very substrata of his being. Um, so I'm going to be reading Cody's poem, Colorblind Contradictions. But, before you, but oh. before you do, check out this slide. This is of interest. Come on, you know it is. Look at the topic. Oh, it just changed. It just changed. <laughs> Thank you. 
Have you ever had to defend your existence to your white friends and family who call you militant, thinking it's only black folks you can see? Color-blinded cheerleaders shouting, see you people as humans, never as skin tones. I mean, Barack Obama's made it. Besides, slavery's been gone. Fear flashes in their eyes as my voice begins to rise, saying, where I stand today is a long way from that fairy tale innocence of my youth, believing the United States must be synonymous with freedom, democracy, truth. You see, slavery as we know today by another name, prisons have become industries, producing black and brown bodies enchained. I spent 14 years in Catholic schools hearing about the glory of heaven where God's love and goodness will prevail. But now I question the value to suffer. Suffer for a world with so many trapped inside this living hell. My education took me beyond the confines of textbooks bound with lies, causing my innocent mind to contemplate the state of other folks' demise. How come my friends in public school got 30-year-old textbooks and I am the only one from my block today who made it out of town? Well, they still pregnant, in jail, jobless. Yet everyone from the Catholic school was college bound. Why do white folks tell me I don't act black if it ain't about race? Then call me their best friend but tell nigger jokes to my face. What's the basis of all this? If Abe Lincoln apparently set us free, how can they call themselves Christians, yet claim their God could never look like me? Blasting hip hop in brand new cars, throwing private parties in mansions, praying for God to bless the poor while adopting conservative Republican stances, I'm so confused by all these contradictions. Can't someone please make it clear why, in 2015, I still have to live my life in fear, not knowing whether each time I leave the house might be my last, because trigger-happy cops call me suspicious, then blast. The media portrays us as criminals, uneducated thugs, burdens to society, that only make babies and sell drugs. If Barack Obama made it, why are my sisters and brothers burning in the flames of a nightmarish American dream that just sounds deranged? Compared to the inequality I see every single day, this world leaves us so broken. Is it any wonder people kneel down to pray? So, my family, if you truly want to love me, I have just two conditions. First, recognize all the diversity within human existence simultaneously. We're all constructed from the same elements. So what, you ask and question my relevance? Second, accept that our collected humanities all intertwine so my freedom's dependent upon yours, yours dependent on mine. That means as long as teary-eyed mothers ride along with black babies in hearses, that I'll continue to cry out for justice in all my verses. Thank you to Cody Young, thank you. Um, we'd now like to get you involved, so we're gonna turn this over to Candace who's gonna lead you through the final part um, of our activity. Okay, we have an art project for the, all the tables to do together. The two tables that don't have the big black circles, if you can take your chair and then just squeeze into some of these other tables so you can participate in the art project. Is that okay? Please? And then we're picking up the prints because we're giving you guys chalk. <laughs> we don't want the prints to get all messed up. So again, 
You guys have been a part of something that's really transformative for the college, and we are doing a documentary of this whole process. In addition to that, there is an exhibition of these big um, pieces, the circle pieces that you're working on, all the data, the poems, there was a class that made poems too, um, the printmaking class, their prints, and the exhibition's going to start April 1st, and it'll be up in the atrium gallery on the third floor, and it'll be up there all summer long too, so just look for it in a around April 1st. So, so what we're going to do as soon as the prints are all picked up is you're going to get white pins and you still have your black pins and the Sharpies are still out, right? Michaela? Okay. So, and you're going to get chalk. And what you're going to do with that is you are going to create, it'll be like a graffiti style art piece. How many of you guys have been exposed to graffiti type art? Well, we're hoping that a couple from every table is. <laughs> We do have art students among the table, so all the Art 100 students, where are you? Printmaking students, everybody should be, there should be some art people at the table. I do want to say that words themselves are powerful, and you can create a word as an art. Like you could have just one great big word, and that is your art piece. I mean, there's powerful words. Like if you saw the prints, they had words in their prints. You know, peace. What, what are some of the prints? Where's Haley? I'm not Haley. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. What were the words? Same roots, same different fruit. What are some of the words that you had, Cassie? Diversity, love, freedom, hope, um, change, future. Yeah, you got a bunch of them. Peace, peace. So there's also words already written. You guys wrote words. So you can pick out words in here like truth. Oh, the truth is out there. X Files. Um, nine times out of ten. I mean, there's words in here that you've already put in here that you can then extrapolate and make bigger make them bold. You could like do outlining of the words. Anything goes. This is your guys' chance to just do, have some fun. Make a mark. So we have how many minutes until 11, right? Or 1045? Oh, yes. We are presenting some of them. So you can be standing up and doing your art standing up and crouching over this. That's what I envisioned, that you're standing up and kind of vigorously drawing on this vigorously. Uh, and before we end, we're going to present three of them. So you have about, what's the time here? Seems like you have about uh, 15 minutes to kind of create, 10 to 15 minutes. So you have to kind of be working, all right? And then we're going to pick three of them and present them and show them, all right? And then we'll be done. So let's really stand up and sort of hunch over and take some chalk and some white uh, p pens and let's go with our art collaborative art you can do it in a circle you can do it you know any which way there doodle draw ooh there's some fun stuff coming on over here remember some of the numbers and the graphs, if someone wants to do a graph or some numbers. There were some interesting numbers that uh, kind of came out of these presentations and numbers can be really cool in art. So remember the numbers and the graphs. We're gonna get the graphs back up in a little bit, but for now in the background, we have the psychology students have some quotes and those are up on the, on the uh, charts here. And if you wanna use some of those quotes, you can. Ooh, there's good stuff. Ooh, ooh, you guys are artistic. I'm seeing some beautiful art. Some people are doing smearing and smudging. 
which you can do with the chalk. You get the chalk and you rub it and then you smudge it all over, smudgy smudge. And I see some people getting lots of color in spirals around the edges and they're just smearing the color around the edges. So there's lots of stuff. You can go big, get your hands all messy and chalky and just get in there and get kind of really involved. And if you want to, you can send uh, someone from your table to look at what's going on at other tables and get some ideas because there's some awesome ideas that are happening. Ooh, ooh, we're doing a hand tracing a over here. A hand tracing. I like that. Oh, yes. All of the printmaking students, please um, stand up really quick. They're at one at each table. They're, they want to give them a round of applause. <laughs> they did, you, I have to say those prints were, they were phenomenal and they, this class did an astounding job. And by the way, it's the first time that they've ever carved or created a print. Another round of applause. <laughs>
Yeah, we're going to have to collect the pens, so just leave the pens and the chalk where they are. Maybe start putting the chalk away. We'll have to use these pens again. I hope that this process of doing art and taking an interdisciplinary look through math, statistics, psychology quotes, poetry, reading, and art, and anthropology, and their, uh, their cultural approach, and, uh, and children's literature through a kindergarten book, that you were able to think a little bit of more about this difficult topic and maybe kind of advance your thinking about it a bit more. All right, so uh, make sure that you've signed up. And thank you very much for coming. And I think we're done with free. See ya, woo!